My name is Vivek Tawari, and I am the writer and producer of this project, The Fifth Beatle. Uh, it's based on the life of Brian Epstein, who is the Beatles' manager, and we are making a graphic novel that's coming out on November 19th, um, and it's available for pre-order now, if I can plug it. Um, you can get more information at fifthbeatle.com, but it's a, you can get it on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, on IndieBound, etc. And we're also making a film, and the film is uh, very knee-deep in development, and um, as I said, it's based on the life of Brian Epstein, who is the man who discovered the Beatles uh, when they were playing at a cellar in Liverpool. Um, they were a relatively unknown band, and he was the one that walked around saying the Beatles are going to be bigger than Elvis. He was the first to believe, and um, he got them a record deal when no one wanted to sign them. He convinced Ed Sullivan to book them when he wasn't interested. He put them in the suits and the haircuts. He really was the fifth Beatle. He was the guy that brought their, the message of the Beatles to the rest of the world. So it's, um, it's a great story, and I'm excited to be telling it. So I discovered the Brian Epstein story when I was in business school, and uh, I, I produce a lot of uh, theater, film, and television, and I was dreaming about doing that, about working the entertainment space and I tend to be a little academic so I thought that if I'm going to be working in the entertainment space I should study the life of some of the great entertainment visionaries so that's what led me to a study of Brian and the management of the Beatles because I thought that was the the, the, the template for, for writing and rewriting the rules of the pop music business um, and I was looking for a business blueprint all the things that I mentioned earlier how he got them a record deal how he put them in the suits and the haircuts etc and that was a terribly inspiring story it's fascinating and intriguing and it's in the book and that's great, and that's what I was looking for. However, it was the human side of his story that I knew nothing about when I started this, this research that really struck a deep chord for me. And in brief, he was gay and Jewish and from Liverpool. And in the 1960s, those were three very severe obstacles. It was a felony to be gay. There was quite a lot of anti-Semitism. And Liverpool, while it had importance as a port town, there was nothing cultural going on there. Um, so for this gay Jewish man from Liverpool to say, I found a band and they're going to be bigger than Elvis, it was absurd. Um, and, and while I, in my life, have never um, faced obstacles that are that severe, I could also relate to the, his sort of feeling like an outsider in his chosen field. Um, I'm a first-generation American. My family's from Guyana by way of India. And you don't see young people of my ethnic background getting involved in the fields that I'm getting involved in. And so I could, I could also sort of relate to that struggle. And so the Brian Epstein story became one that, that really is near and dear to my heart. Um, and, and so while, yes, I am a Beatles fan, um, it really is the Brian Epstein story that I want to tell, not the Beatles story, you know, but they're both in there. And if we do our job correctly, um, you know, yes, it's a great Beatles story, and Beatles fans are going to love this because it's an untold Beatles story, and, you, and I think it's going to be a revelation. You know, they're going to see a side to the Beatles story that, that they've never heard before. Um, however, you know, at its core, it's an inspirational human story, and you don't need to be a Beatles fan to be inspired by this story. So when I first started thinking about the Brian Epstein story, about Wanting to, wanting to tell it as a story. Um, as I mentioned, I, I first started researching Brian's life when I was in, in business school, so not to date myself too much, but that was you know, 16, 17 years ago. Um, but it was about five years ago, five, six years ago, that I decided I wanted to tell the story professionally as a graphic novel and as a film. And, and when I first thought, thought, how do I want to tell this story, I immediately thought of color palette. Um, it starts off in 1961 Liverpool, which is very, it's industrial, it's dark, it's gray, it's depressed. It's very black and white, is the way that I saw it. It ends in 1967 London, which is the dawn of the psychedelic era. It's the summer of love. It's very technicolor. So in my mind, in a lot of ways, it's the story of going from black and white to technicolor. So seeing it in color terms, that immediately spoke to me as visual, as visual arts. So that felt like graphic novel and film. Um, and the reason that I wanted to do both is because there's certain things you could do with each medium that you, you, you can't do with the other, you know? Uh, the very obvious one is sound. Um, I'm very proud to say that after two and a half years of working on it, we got rights to Beatles music. We have the approval of the band and did a deal with Sony ATV, who control the music publishing. And we are the first film in history about the Beatles to have gotten access to Beatles music. And so we're obviously going to use it. You know, we have the, the right to use music, and so we're going to. So in the film, there are extended sequences that are driven by music. Um, and I, it's wonderful to be able to do that. Obviously, in a book and that, that's physical, um, there's no audio in the book. And so the, the, so we found other dynamic ways of capturing sound. Um, you know, I, I think the cover, you know, with the band jumping up like that, we tried to, uh, to create a certain dynamism with this. And personally, it might sound a little poetic, but I think that cover sings. You know, 
So I wanted to do both because I think there are different things you can do in each medium. You know, there's a sequence in the book uh, in which Brian gives a press release to introduce the world to Sgt. Peppers, and it's depicted in a, in a very sort of um, uh, surreal, fantastical way. I describe it as, it, as it, that page in the book is, uh, is almost as if Salvador Dali had done an early Star Wars poster, if that makes any sense. I can show it to you. Um, and, you know, that's something that you can very easily do in a graphic novel if you have a talented artist like Andrew Robinson. But, but if we tried to do that in the film, it would be very bizarre or bordering on impossible. So again, it was doing both allowed me to, um, to tell all the different sides of the story the way that I wanted to tell it. So it's been great fun and very fortunate that we can do both. And then jumping off, having focused so much on the visuals here, you're producing and writing the film, right? Correct. So are you hoping that whatever director you pick up is going to use what you wanted to achieve in the graphic novel in terms of visuals in his film or her film? Uh -huh. I wouldn't say hoping. I, I, I would just say it's an option. You know, I mean, uh, I wrote the, um, the the graphic novel script and I wrote the screenplay. And as I said, um, I respect both mediums as different mediums. So in some ways, because the graphic novel is, has has been completed long before, you know, we have any, we're out to directors right now for the film. So in some ways, the film will feel like an adaptation of the book, but it's not. I mean, if you read the two scripts, you'll see they are significantly different. And they're both mine, because I, I wrote them both. So, so I feel like my heart's in, and, and, and the way that I want to tell the story is in both of them. So, you know, I'm pretty Producing it, so I will find a director that shares my vision, and if he or she wants to use the graphic novel as source material, as inspiration, that would be wonderful because I'm very proud of it. But that's not the plan. You know, if he or she doesn't want to look at the book at all, that's exciting to me as well. So I wouldn't say that I'm hoping. I would say that it's just another tool to present to present our creative team. Is there any ideal way you want people to experience this, like the graphic novel before the film, or wait? Yeah, no, I think that is the ideal way to, to, to do it, and that's why we're releasing it in that way. That's why the book coming out on November 19th and uh, you know I'm, I'm happy to say that given the fact we are making this this graphic novel that, that people seem very excited about at this early stage and we have music rights um, I'm proud to report that you know Hollywood and, and the UK film industry are are enthusiastically uh, embracing this project and so I don't want to drop names or anything but we are in some very exciting discussions I hope we'll have some some film news to report in the next several months um, so it's a long-winded way of saying I think the film won't be too far behind the graphic novel and that is the way that I hope people will experience it. I hope they'll read the graphic novel, they'll familiarize with themselves with the story and then they'll see the film which will add another layer to the story and music and will be a whole different way of presenting it. So, so it sounds like you're still developing the film now but do you have a hope for when you want to cross over into pre-production and then production? You know, um, as I said, we are enjoying some really uh, uh, upper level interest um, amongst filmmakers and uh, the kind of people we're talking to, um, scheduling is always an issue. So, you know, I'm willing to, to, to wait to make sure we do this one properly. So I don't know, you know, I would love to be shooting, uh, you know, sometime early next year and that's a little bit of a goal for us, but, uh, but we're also going to wait and do it right. I've been working on this project for six years and been researching it since I was in school 20 years ago. Um, so it's a, you know we want to take the time to do it right. That being said, um, I suspect that we will be shooting this film sometime next year, whether it's early next year or mid or late. It'll, it's, it'll probably be shot in 2014.